Thank you all for inviting me. I know some of you. Um, this is a nightmare for me because I'm wearing a microphone, and I don't like microphones, and I'm speaking in front of attorneys. How many of you are attorneys? Oh, yeah, they're the worst. Um, it's like if you, if, you, if you say something like, okay, the word problem is the car left Cincinnati heading east. They go, what kind of tires did it have on? Uh, what were the spark plugs? You know, so um, I'm going to try to talk about the practical aspects of drug testing and some of the things we've faltered into over the years and, um, and how it might relate to 788 and the legalization of medical marijuana. Um, I'm going to let you know I'm on a crusade about some things about this. Uh, I have definite opinions and I'm going to share them so the attorneys will be throwing shoes at me by the end of our time here. I promise I won't. Okay, one, I got one promise and I have witnesses. Okay, yeah, okay very good, very good. Um, anyway, uh, I just want to throw out a scenario. This is not a fictitious scenario, but I want you to kind of pick through it in, in our thinking together. Um, a person is uh, abusing drugs. Now, do you think that that would ever get somebody sideways with the court system, a life of drug abuse, where they are in the court system, in and out, over and over again, going into court, probation, jail time, coming back out. Uh, they can't stay away from the drugs, and so they get drug tested, and they are required to do mandatory drug testing every once in a while. Uh, the court decides to take the baby away from a mother because of that. Pretty serious decision, right? When you look at that drug testing, what would you think about it if you knew that the person had no recourse, no secondary testing, no confirmation testing done away from the site, and no specimen was retained in the future for a challenge? What would you think about that as a problem? I mean, if the mother is standing there saying, they're going to take my child away based on a drug test, and you go back and ask for that sample again, and it's already been discarded and thrown away, what does that do in your thinking? And I didn't know I'd have such a predominantly female group today. I mean, I, I, I didn't expect this. But, um, but clearly, we see the problem with that, OK? Serious problems with that. Uh, I've actually had those conversations on a few occasions where you have a mom crying, looking for recourse because her court-related drug test was handled that way. And she's wanting to challenge it because of the loss of a child or taking a child away. And, uh, and we can't get a sample to retest because it's been discarded quickly. I mean, within days, it's gone. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of on a crusade even for work-related drug testing because if we take away all of those safeguards for the individual, we have a problem on our hands. I'm just giving you a, ca a case from court. But even if somebody has a terrible methamphetamine addiction, do you think that they have a right to accurate and good testing? Yes, they do. They have the right, if they're going to be tested, that they have credible testing done by knowledgeable people that can be confirmed and re-verified and challenged if they need to. That just should be a requirement. And uh, sometimes that doesn't happen, actually. Um, so. My goal this time is just to bring forward some ideas about good standard testing procedures. Now, Oklahoma law has changed over the years about drug testing, and so I'll give you a quick history. A long time ago, there was no guidance. It was kind of a free-for-all. Many, many years ago, it was just a free-for-all if you had good quality testing or if you even did testing at all. Uh, several years ago, uh, some members of the legislature and committees got together, and they scoured the DOT uh, procedures about how drug testing was required for the DOT and they said this looks pretty good so if you read the the guidelines back then it almost mirrored how the DOT told you to do drug testing in every aspect of it um, it had some weaknesses it had some areas that needed some improvement some things were written a little bit too tight so that employers were really bound with some problems with testing and so they went back and revisited those things and several years later they decided to modify them slightly, and so it got a little more practical and for good use. Anyway, so they've modified them, and then more recently, they modified them even more. So we have some very confusing wording out there. Uh, they've opened it all up to uh, quick testing and who can serve as a screening laboratory, 
things like that. Uh, you know, how, how is initial testing supposed to be done? If it's non-negative, how does it get handled? There's even some confusion brought about because employers are not forbidden at all from testing on their own employees. All right? Now, right there, I just want to reveal there's a little bit of a problem. We're going to talk about that. If I'm testing on one of my own employees, guess what? I see the results and all confidentiality just right out the window. Okay? So, uh, I just want to say the toothpaste is out of the tube. I mean, we're not going to get that put away. Uh, and so, my crusade is a one-man crusade. <laughs> but, uh, but I would like for every employer to know there is a way to do drug testing that can actually make 788 not a problem. There's a way to do it so that 788 is not a headache for you. So I just want to build a common vocabulary. I do want to look at DOT's way of doing it. And you're going, but DOT doesn't apply to me. I, I don't have people under DOT. Or you might. You might have a mix of DOT and non-DOT. But I want you to know what DOT does. On an ongoing basis, they review the regulations. They have committees come together, expert testimony, year after year. And they're constantly pushing on this. And they're thinking years ahead about how we're going to modify the next set of regulations. They're working on things right now that won't come out till 2020. Okay, so they really do pull and reevaluate on these procedures, trying to make them better and better for real world. Um, I will tell you, you know, working in this industry, uh, there's some things in DOT guidelines that I would say that could be improved, but there's a lot of things I think they do really, really well. So let's look at some of those things. And what I want to do is do a quick run through because also what I've discovered, and I, I don't know, have any of you been in any of my classes before for you know, supervisors and stuff? Got a few people. I actually have a person back here who helps me teach some of those classes. Uh, it's, uh, Michelle's over here with me. So, so uh, we've done these classes before uh, for employers and things like that. And also, I want to let you know, one of my goals today was to try to do away with very wordy slides. Aren't you happy about that? I have few words today. So we just had a little cartoon strip going up here. So it would be a little bit easier for us. But anyway. Um, I do want to run through all the, uh, some definitions so that everybody's on the same page. I have found too many times, I get calls every week about some misunderstanding about some of the basic vocabulary of drug testing. So I do want to take just a few minutes and talk about some things that, that uh, deal with drug testing so we have a common uh, co co conversation about it. I want to talk about the reasons for testing. Uh, and just as a starting point, we're going to look at random testing where you have a population of people at the company and they randomly pick them throughout the year. And I do want you to know that uh, everybody's name goes in the hat. A subset is drawn out, usually quarterly, and, uh, and drug testing occurs. I want to reassure you, if it's done properly, there's no bias in the process. People will come up more than once a year, and you're going to hear the griping employee. You know what I'm talking about. I've been pulled three times this year, and that's true. I want you to know we do random selections, and we don't care who comes up, and they come up more than once a year. It happens. And then they'll truthfully tell you, I have coworkers that haven't been picked in two years. And that's true too. The idea here is that it's supposed to keep that constant, ever present possibility that I could get tested. And so, um, uh, but anyway, so random is random. And, and I just want you to know that if you ever have the griping employee about it being picked on more than once, that is not being picked on. That's just part of the process. Um, Another reason is you can do, of course, pre-employment testing. If you have people that are non-DOT going into DOT positions, that's still a pre-employment test. I mean, I'm going from a non-DOT job into a DOT job. You have to treat it as if it is a pre-employment because they're going under, under new regulations. A uh, little side note, uh, like I said, DOT is already working on things that are coming out in the next couple of years. Uh, if you hire somebody, be honest, do any of you are any of you not familiar with the idea that if I hire a new person, I have to retrieve their records from their previous employer to make sure they were in compliance? Is anybody drawing a blank on that? Like, what? I'm supposed to do what? Okay. This is a gap a lot of times that employers are not familiar with. How do you know you're not hiring that guy from New Jersey that failed two tests up there and ran over somebody because he was on methamphetamine if he doesn't tell you? And right now, there's forms you have to download from the DOT website and fill it out with that prospective employee and retrieve their records that the previous employer can say he was in good standing with the regulations or he was not in good standing with the regulations or, or he's going through follow-up testing for the next three years. Guess what you have to do now? If you hire them, you have to go through follow-up testing for the next three years. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So um, DOT is actually making that process easier. Uh, starting in a couple of years, you're going to have a central clearinghouse that you can go to uh, and look it up by their driver's license number at the time. 
and, and find out what their history was without having to go through all the ordering through the forms. Okay, so it's going to be a lot easier in the future. Uh, so just be aware that that's coming. It's not out yet, but it's coming. Of course, there's post-accident. Anytime you have an accident, uh, DOT and non-DOT differ on this. Oh, you want me to talk about random, don't you? I know she was chomping at the bit about that. I'm so sorry. Um, real quickly, uh, let me go back to random testing. There is differences on that for DOT and non-DOT as well. You may have a, a pool of DOT people and they have to be tested according to DOT regulations. There is some nuances to the non-DOT side of things and you can always share that with them, right? I just want to give you a quick overview of that. For non-DOT, there are some groups of people that may or may not be able to be legally tested randomly, okay? So the, the, if you read the state law, it talks about they have to be directly involved with the safety of others, uh, carry a firearm, things like that, in, drug interdiction, things like that. So again, go back to OMAG for, those, for those gui that guidance. But, Yeah, very good, very good. And so be aware that there are some nuances in the random testing uh, that, that we have to be mindful for for non-DOT. It's not that you can't test your non-DOT people randomly. You may, but there's a, a caveat about public employees, okay? If you're a private company and you have non-DOT people, test away, okay? You're perfectly fine to do that. Um, anyway, so about post-accident. DOT is very clear about the definitions for accidents. They have paragraphs long definitions of if this or this or this occurs, we have an accident and you have to do a drug test. It can be for federal motor carriers or aviation or whatever. Uh, for non-DOT, the wording is also different. Under the state guidance, it, it gives you uh, regulations about what you, when you may do that. It usually involves a dollar amount. And have you talked about OSHA yet, all the new OSHA fund that's coming out? OSHA has come up with some new things that you also have to have a reasonable suspicion component. It doesn't mean that you have to say, I believe they're on drugs, but you have to not treat it like a weapon, you know, that you're going to use against employees that, that come up, uh, that have had an accident. So again, um, OMAG, have fun with the OSHA part of it too, okay? You can go back to them. It's too involved and too confusing, and the courts are still deciding on it right now. It's one of those things with the OSHA part. Do you still, are you having some difficulty with the OSHA yeah, component? Well, Yeah. So we yeah. Don't have questions about right. And you're going to probably continue to the the OSHA part of it is just a little bit confusing. It's it's uh, you know when may you do that? What is considered reasonable? You know, are you doing it as a blunt weapon against one person? You know, I think part of it too is is what they think is going to happen is if you have that plaque on your wall that says it's been 526 days since our last accident or incident, and then the guy has an accident. They're, they don't want them threatening them like, okay, you want us to drug test you now and ruin our perfectly good record? And so it's kind of a weapon. And so they want them to do it in a right way, not as a weapon against these people. So anyway, our next one is, is reasonable suspicion. Uh, so that's the best view I could give you for reasonable suspicion. Um, if, if this is what your guy looks like, you know, come to the class. They'll tell you if he has a medical condition or if he's not doing so well right now. Um, but if you have reasonable suspicion, there are reasons why you have to do uh, testing, okay? Uh, if, if you, for example, have a large uh, truck and somebody has to drive that and they're weaving around as they're walking out to that, you can't ignore it and hope they are doing better tomorrow. You have to address that today, okay? So there is reasonable suspicion. The next two, uh, kind of symbolic here, uh, one is return to duty. I just had to U-turn that. If somebody is out of compliance with their policy in any way, and I want to do a pop quiz. If somebody fails a test, is that okay? No. I mean, if you had, if they were a bus driver for your school kid and they fail a test, uh, you know, it's not okay. We have to do something about that. They are not allowed to return to duty for this or any other employer till they go through the return to duty process, which means they go to see a counselor that knows the regulations because a counselor is not just there to hug them and say, don't do drugs. It's an accountability thing where they say, in my professional opinion, you're gonna go drive a truck full of gasoline again or a school bus full of kids. So they have to know what they're saying yes to. And so when the counselor counsels with them, they might meet with them for a week or meet with them for six months. We don't know. Depends on how bad the problem is. And then they would do a return to duty letter back to the company and he can return to duty now. So when he takes his test and he passes his test, he can go back to duty, okay? He can start driving again. And then he goes into follow-up testing. And so my check marks are just saying, 
He has to do it six times a year for up to five years under DOT. Uh, so I go in and I don't know I'm going to do it today, but I have to get follow-up tested. My counselor or whatever mechanism in place has told my boss I have to do a follow-up test today. Okay, so I'm follow-up tested. A month from now, maybe I get it again. Two months from now, from then, I do it again. Uh, and then I get randomly tested. I have to go in for my random test, too. I'm not exempt from any of these just because I've done something else near, in near proximity to it. So anyway, any time that um, somebody doesn't comply, it still goes through the same th thing, okay? Let me be very clear. I, I want a lot of employers, again, forgive me, but a lot of employers, I pop question this and they go, huh, I guess we'll let them go back the next day. Not the answer. If somebody gets sent down to a collection site and you give them an authorization form and do give them an authorization form, very, very, very helpful document. It lets the collection site know when they were supposed to be there. Very, very important. Uh, did they show up on time? What are the testing? What's the reason for testing? But if you sent somebody down this morning at 9 o'clock and gave them half an hour because it's a 20-minute trip over to your collection site and he shows up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, or three days later, or three weeks later? Has that ever happened? All the time. People have shown up literally. Uh, I've had people come in for a drug test and the collector calls me up and says, this is weird, can you talk to this guy? And I do, and I go, now when were you supposed to come down? He goes, oh, about three weeks ago. And he thinks it's gonna be okay that we can still collect him. If you send somebody, and you know it's a 15 minute trip to your collection site, DOT puts it on the employer that you have a reasonable amount of time for them to get there. And that wouldn't be six hours. That would be 20 to 30 minutes, okay? So you would put that on their authorization form. So if somebody is sent at eight o'clock in the morning to be there within one hour and they show up at five o'clock in the afternoon or four o'clock the next day, they are out of compliance. And you're going, well, what does that mean? That means that they've tried to figure out a way to borrow somebody else's urine, keep it warm enough when they get it into the collection site so they don't fail their test. Okay. I wish to anything that I would have kept it on my phone because I've gotten this story from more than one person that uh, local uh, convenience stores have to put signs on their microwaves, please don't heat yellow liquids in our microwave. Okay? And I actually had it, I had it sent to me where they had the microwave and they took a picture of it and sent it to me because people would go in and heat up a yellow liquid, what could that be? Gatorade maybe, and then they would <laughs> slide this little package down in the back of their pants and run across the street to the collection site, okay? Because they were trying to make sure that they could pass the test, all right? Uh, so again, these, there's thousands of ways that people will try to manipulate the process. So that's why when you notify them, DOT sends out the same nasty email newsletter over and over and over again. I've gotten it, I, I'm on their mailing list. I get this little letter all the time, just like employers would, that when you notify somebody, they're supposed to make every effort to immediately go from your site of notification to the site right away. No detours, no, no going, you know, taking two hours to get there. So if somebody shows up at five o'clock in the afternoon when they should have been there by nine o'clock in the morning, what would need to happen to them under the DOT regulations? before they can drive again. They have to go through the return to duty process, see a counselor, the counselor has to free them to go back to work again, and then they go under follow-up testing up to six times a year for five years. Uh, we've actually seen this occur where we had a grumpy gentleman walk out because he had gotten picked, uh-oh, there you go, uh, gotten picked three times that year, you know the story, I'm not doing this, and he goes out in the parking lot, smokes a couple of cigarettes, just to show his boss how irritated he is. And the boss called up DOT, and DOT says, you have a refusal. He goes, yeah, but I know this guy, he's grumpy. He's just out there, he's gonna be smoking a cigarette, kicking the dirt, he's gonna come back in here in a little bit. We don't care, said DOT. And he's going, but he's like 60 years old. 60 year olds don't do drugs, okay? I have one word for you, Woodstock. How old were those people then? <laughs> How old are they now, okay? Okay, so there are 60 year olds that fail drug tests, okay? So just understand that DOT doesn't say, huh, maybe they won't. They might be texting a friend to bring them something. A 60 year old, they don't even know how to text, okay? Yeah, they do. So anyway, I'm, I'm almost 60, so shut up, okay? Anyway, uh, all right, so let's move on. Uh, now, 
when you send somebody down for a drug test, again, I'm staying with DOT. We'll come back to non-DOT, and I'll hurry up. Let me get moving here. I'm sorry. All right, uh, so there's controlled collection. So when you send somebody for a collection, they are told to remove loose outer clothing, hats, pocket contents. They check photo ID. We've had stunt doubles come in for other people mm -hmm. before. You with me? Mm -hmm. I mean, where they're not really the person, okay? We've even had it get so, I'm going to tell you one, but, you know, don't try to use it on your own. But we had a fake supervisor come in and identify a fake employee, okay? It happens. That's, their, that's how desperate they are. Who knows if money's being passed around, everybody's just really good friends, but they're posing as the supervisor and posing as the employee. So when they come in, we check ID. They're supposed to get ready and, and take off loose outer clothing. There's a reason for this. It minimizes their chances of bringing things into the bathroom with them. We've had people take off their shirts, I mean their sweatshirts, accidentally grab their shirt and have duct tape going across here where they have a bag of yellow liquid underneath their arm trying to keep it warm. So there's reasons for doing all of this. Um, they're asked to wash their hands. So that's a sink, so it's hand washing. That's my icon for, okay. Uh, uh, when the specimens are collected, they are sealed and it's split into two collections. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the reason for the split. Very, very important under DOT that they get split. I'll just mention it now. If you don't have a split, you don't have recourse, okay? Recourse is very, very important. If somebody ever wants to challenge a test, let me go back down now that it's been six days and give you another specimen and prove that I was negative for cocaine six days ago, okay? See the problem with that? So they've already been tested, but you want that split unopened cup for challenges. And it goes off to the laboratory, and this is exactly what we look like at the lab, okay? <laughs> We're maniacal drug testing fiends, okay? So that's me when I don't shave in the morning. Okay, anyway, no, it's, it's, it's actually not at all what it's like. It's very, very structured, of course. Uh, laboratories have to be sequestered from everywhere else. Uh, Non-laboratory employees cannot just walk into the lab. We have to have proximity badges and all that kind of stuff, you know? Visitors have to get signed in. It's very, very strict. It's a, think of high security. But all the testing is done so that they go to the A cup only and they test it, they screen it. If a, if a group of drugs shows up, like an opiate or an amine, it goes back for confirmation on the same cup. Did that cup really come up positive? And so when all of that is done, we see, okay, there was an amine there and it was methamphetamine or an antihist antihistamine or fentramine. They're all amines. Or an opiate could be codeine or heroin. You get the idea? Oxycontin. Uh, by the way, I know y'all who are familiar with the DOT, you've heard about the latest change in their policies and their, um, their latest panel of drugs. Uh, the modifications are not as harsh as you might think. They're doing opioids now, which do some of the synthetics. How many of you hear that on the news every week now? Opioid abuse is so high. So they've expanded, DOT has expanded the opioids that they're looking for now. So it includes, uh, it includes things like Oxycontin. Some of the synthetics are involved now. Anyway, so once that testing gets done, it goes into the hands of a medical review officer. And this is a doctor who does all of this before you get the results, okay? The doctor gets these results first. They talk privately to the donor if something comes up and they give them a chance to give medical explanation. And they will actually call the, the pharmacy or the doctor who prescribed, make sure that this is all real, okay? And so when they talk to the person, they identify themselves their training is extensive. Their textbook is literally this thick. It's not a blow-off pamphlet class. They have to pass a class because they, they could be a great physician and not know the first thing about the regulations. They have to know the regulations when they're doing this. So the, the MRO has a, a standard set of, of questions they have to ask, and so they go through all of that and they talk with the individual and give them a chance to explain, and then they will uh, research it as needed, and then when you get the result, you have a final result on your hands. You don't have to question any medical questions. The person might come back to you and say, oh no, I'm taking a prescription. La, 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 that's not our, our concern. If they wanna give us that answer, we call back, or have them call back the medical review officer privately. So um, anyway, the only thing that will be different from this is breath alcohol testing. Drug testing has to be sent, well, is sent off to a laboratory for DOT. Breath testing is done on site because you get the screen and the confirmation right there and then together, okay? Um, now, the MRO also talks to them about challenges, re, you know, their recourse, uh, what will happen if, if they don't have a medical explanation. They do talk to them about those things. But this is the point where the person can say, hey, I've taken such and such drug, and the doctor can say that doesn't account for that. OK? 
Okay, they can have that conversation with them. Or the person can say, I want to challenge that, that result. And the MRO can say, okay, at your own expense, if you want to have the B cup sent off, we can do that for you. Okay, now I will tell you, the employer can pay that too and just like get wages back from the employee later on. It's possible to go that way. Um, but usually the MRO offers it to the individual to prepay as earnest money because it's real easy for the employee to go, my employer's paying for it? Great. <laughs> I'll send off. In fact, we've actually had them call us and say, how long does it take for reconfirmation results to come back? We go about a week. Go good. Okay. And then they want their employer to pay that so that they can go find another job in those few days, hopefully before the, the hammer falls, you know? So anyway, that's all, that's all under the MRO. Now, I'll tell you what's come out with the state guidelines several years ago. The allowing of, of quick testing is, is part of this or making initial labs, most places do not have the equipment to have a true screening laboratory. There are a few of them, don't get me wrong. But by and large, what you see happening is quick testing, okay? Now these are examples of, of quick tests and you can see the temperature sensitive strip and you can see a row of membranes on that side. And what's supposed to happen is, is when there's something positive there, uh, a line will or will not appear. It's kind of like a pregnancy test for drugs, you know? You have the little line, if it's, if it's not there, it gives you a little negative sign. If it's there or questionable, it might be very faint or not at all, okay? Something like that would happen. Now the problem with this is, is if the employer has a policy that says we do quick testing or we have an initial testing laboratory that we send them to and they do their drug testing, uh, we want you to send back results right away. Well, they get immediately within a little while and this has such great appeal. Just, this is so attractive. I get my results within the hour? Wow, okay, wonderful. They send nine people over and eight results come back. And then that ninth one, come back, that ninth one comes back and it is, um, a lot of times the laboratories, because they're not real laboratories, are releasing what it's screened positive for. Okay? D yeah, I see this going on. Oops. Okay? So what does that do? The reason I went back and started off with my court case is because we can look clearly at how wrong that is. Okay, but when we have an individual who doesn't have the benefit of the medical review officer doing that job for them, that barrier of confidentiality is gone. All right, and there's some confusion about when the, MR, uh, when the donor can divulge drug use. If you read them and you're just reading them, the mention of an MRO is somewhere else in the regulations. It talks, they have to be able to pre-divulge what they're taking. Well, who do they divulge that to? It's not answered. And the problem is, is they start talking to you about what they're taking when, if you followed the DOT model, you, that question would never come up. The MRO would take care of every bit of that, unbeknownst to the company. All they get back is a negative or positive as a final determination, okay? But this way, the employee is pre-divulging what they're taking, which really is a big no-no. I mean, how many of you go up to your employees and go, so what are you taking today? It doesn't that make, HR people, doesn't that make you kind of get a little bit itchy, You're breaking out hives, going, ooh, whoa, I can't ask that question, okay? All right. Then we have the other thing about, again, the preliminary non-negative results. What, how do those get reported? Now, again, with conventional testing, it is off at a laboratory, and they do go online usually and get their results from the medical review officer, and they might have sent those nine people and eight of them came back. But all that tells you is further testing. It doesn't give you any kind of preliminary result because it's not done yet, okay? Sometimes the MRO will call, it's not the illicit drug use, and it comes out negative in the long run anyway. It takes a few extra days, but it's still negative, all right? But sometimes it doesn't. And then, of course, the big issue, you know this word, everybody here knows this word, HIPAA. It does kind of infringe on their confidentiality. It's a real problem when we bypass the, the use of a medical review officer. I was at one of these lectures where I was sitting where you are, listening to an attorney talk. Sorry, it's gonna be hard to, but anyway, and he was very openly saying, yes, if you have an employee who has a license to use marijuana, they need to divulge that to you. And this is where I'm kind of going, uh-oh, wait. If we used a model that, and, and there are companies, a lot of companies that do this, they follow the exact same model as DOT. They're doing non-DOT testing, but they don't do any preliminary quick testing on their site. It all goes off to a lab and it's behind closed doors until the final disposition comes out from the medical review officer, okay? And so the beauty of that is, guess what? If I'm doing it that way, I never have to ask what they're taking, okay? Now, does that mean they can be on marijuana or on cocaine and be okay? No, not necessarily, because the MRO can release a positive result. And there are also things that they can do, 
where they are, um, they are able to uh, say it's negative, but, okay? MRO has that latitude to do that. So when we talk about medical marijuana use, we can put that underneath that, that umbrella of it would just be like anything else. The only weird part about the state is how many of you have to pay $100 every couple of years to take coding? You pay for your prescription. Isn't that kind of a weird extra component? I have to write something to the state, but I think it's so they can regulate it now and try to get their feet down about it. There's an extra cost to the juggling of the marijuana component. But, but uh, so there is an extra weirdness to that. But if I'm taking marijuana medically, and by the way, there is benefit to marijuana, okay? Uh, how many of you were smoking a doobie this morning? Okay, did you notice <laughs> when lunch came around, you were ready for lunch, okay? All right, there's a reason for that. It does increase your appetite. You know the munchies? I've heard, okay? But, but really think about it. If somebody, who oftentimes gets the marijuana prescription? It's the person who has cancer, okay? And their appetite goes down. And so if you were not eating well for four days in a row, you'd feel horrible just from that, okay? So marijuana does have benefits, and they've actually found the best way of intake. You know how, again, one of the changes is, can they have it smokable? No, it has to be in a quantifiable pill format or oil or something, you know? Well, um, marijuana smoked is probably the best way to get it into your body, okay? If you're gonna take medical marijuana, roll it, smoke it, okay? It, it does have benefits, and so for cancer treatment, there's, that's one of them right there. Um, but let's look at some of the other things. I mean, when we're talking about CBD oil, and I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit, or, or prescription medications, all these things are kind of treated the same way. Even alcohol, alcohol is legal. There's nothing wrong with drinking. You just have to have rules. I can't drink before I go to work. I can't drink while I'm at work, okay? So um, the, all of these things, you know, if things show up, if you have a medical review officer taking care of all those questions for you, it's done, okay? When that result comes to you, the MRO has already dealt with it. Now, this doesn't get around the fact that there's still many employers, and you, by the way, I just wanna say it, you may not do this for DOT. The fines would be incredible if you were doing DOT people with quick testing, okay? Horrible fines, ridiculously high fines, because they don't want you doing it some way. Can I, can I tell you a little inside story? I train people every month about how to be collectors. They come to me from all over the state, sometimes out of the state, but they come to me for training. and. Uh, Tomorrow, what's today? Yep, tomorrow I have somebody coming in for fatal flaw training, okay? Um, people make mistakes all the time because collectors, for the most part, are not lab people in the truest sense of the word. They're not the people running around with the pipettes and stuff. They're collectors. And I, I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but they're not as, it's not a career thing for them. Well, if you take a collector and you say, now we're gonna make you a tester, well, guess what? The regulations are there that if I'm doing initial testing on your people, I'm a laboratory. Okay, I'm not a collector anymore. There are regulations all over me that I have to do unknown testing. I have to have a laboratory director. I have to have a standard operating procedure that I follow. You with me? Even for doing quick tests. The only exemption that might be if you're the employer testing on your own people. And so, again, going to back, back to my court comparison, is it really fair for an employer to have all this latitude and not know what they're doing or really, really know how to do confirmation, I mean, how to get a confirmation done and also to broach that confidentiality of knowing what they get initially on their result? That really kind of does away with the whole intent of why we do drug testing the way we do. Anyway, so if we do go back to the MRO and have him do his job, I just wanna give you an example of two different accounts, and then I wanna give you a couple of, uh, or just one other thing as a resource. The MRO, when they're talking to these individuals, uh, even, this happened years ago, but we had two tests come in within the same three month period. One was codeine positive, one was cocaine positive, and here they are with the final result of codeine and cocaine. And the medical review officer was gonna call each one of these individuals. And so they call, how many, okay, I'm gonna bro, bro Chippa. How many of you here have ever taken codeine? Okay, wow. The vast majority of the room. If you've taken Tylenol-3, you put codeine into your body, okay? And so when the MRO sees a codeine, most of the time the MRO is like, this is probably gonna be prescription. All right? I mean, it's just an expectation because it's so ubiquitous. I love that word. It makes me sound like I know what I'm saying. But anyway, it's so out there. Everybody's taking codeine, okay? And so when the MRO calls, they just expect, yeah, Dr. Seuss gave me that prescription. They call Dr. Seuss and it turns out to be real, okay? 
But the MRO called the donor and said, hey, I'm the medical review officer for your company. I'm here to, to uh, talk to you about your drug test. Uh, you had codeine positive in your system. Can you please tell me the name of your prescribing physician? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have a prescription. I can, bring you, I can bring you a doctor's note for that. Okay, yeah, that's good, but I, I have to talk to the doctor directly. So if you could, please, just tell me the name of the doctor and where your doctor practices. Yeah, 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 that's good. I will get you that doctor's note. Well, it doesn't work that way. Can I please have the name of your doctor? Yeah, good, yeah, I will get you that doctor's note. Thank you, bye, and hung up on the MRO. It was high. Well, yeah, probably. <laughs> this call was from out of town. They were in another city. Uh, our MRO was here in Oklahoma City, and about three hours later, they showed up at our laboratory knocking on the window, because again, it's a locked area. They can't get in there. And we were looking out there, and there's a person with this doctor's letterhead like this outside of our window. So we go out and meet them and they go, hi, yeah, I'm, a, I'm the donor for such and such test and here's my doctor's note here. So we take it in, give it to the MRO. The MRO looks at it, calls the physician on the letterhead and the physician, it was from that person's town, that physician says, yes, that patient did come into my office today without an appointment and they just stood around in our waiting room for a while and then they left. And you know what they were doing? Stealing letterhead, okay? So then the MRO called the person who's cocaine positive, and they found out that they were a co-owner of the company, had had a sinus surgery, that the sinus surgery required the use, it's very unusual, but they used cocaine, and went back to work the next day because their nose was packed with cotton, because they were a co-owner, and you know how co-owners are, they're workaholics. They're back at work the next day, though they should not have been. They came up randomly, they did the test, they popped positive for cocaine, it confirmed for cocaine, and the MRO called, right, prescribed use, right, surgical use, right, called the surgeon, it turned out to be real. So he had a negative result for cocaine, negative in the sense that it was medically explained, okay? So I hope my comparisons are working for marijuana as well, okay? Uh, now, I want to tell you a little side angle on this, and then I'll conclude, we just open up for a conversation. But what do you do with that? What if you have a driver that has cocaine in their system because of a medical procedure? Well, the MRO, again, can release a negative result, but he cannot drive or he cannot fly his plane. Okay? You with me? So it's okay for them to do that. What if you have a person that comes up to you and says, um, what if you have a person that comes up to you and says, hey, I think I might be taking a medication that, you know, might impair me? or more proactively, the employer should be saying, if you think you're taking a medication that can impair you. Uh, under DOT guidelines, they have to go see their medical examiner or their MRO and have a conversation with them. And that doctor or that physician's assistant who are also certified can make that determination that they should not be driving right now, okay? And they will give a time frame for that. So there are uh, resources in place that if somebody has taken a prescription that they can still it can be known to by the employer. Notice what doesn't come out of that. What they're taking or why they're taking it. Just for this time frame, they cannot drive. You with me? Still that confidentiality is, is protected. So um, anyway, just be aware that um, prescription use, medical marijuana will fall under that same category. Um, I do want to give you one bit of a guidance for your employees. If you ever have employment meetings, and you want to educate your people about drug use, do let them know if they are taking prescription drugs that are not their own, if they're borrowing their family members, that's probably not going to bode well for them, okay? If they have an old medication up in the in medicine cabinet and it's been up there for five years and the, and the label's starting to turn yellow and they get that pain back in their calf again and they want to just go take it again, they can do that, but it muddies the water they would be much wiser to call their physician and say, hey, can I start taking that medication again? I have like 12 pills left in that bottle you, pres bottle you prescribed me 12, you know, five years ago. Can I take them again? And you know why most people don't do that? Because what's the doctor going to say? Come yeah, come and see me. Come on, write a check. Come in and see me. And they don't want to do that. So they don't want to make that call either. Okay? But that's really the safest thing they could do because it makes it very crystal clear if the MRO needs to call them that the doctor has charted they're taking something. Let me talk one last topic and then I'm really done. CBD oil. Hmm. 
Okay, I want to say this real clearly. We can't, it's like Starbucks and CBD are like in lockstep, right? Everywhere you go, there's coffee and there's CBD right next door to each other. You cannot get away from it. But CBD oil, I want to tell you something as I understand it right now. It is not illegal, it's just not legal. Does that make any sense? There's a difference. It's not illegal, it's just not legal. Okay? If you cannot find standards for the manufacture of CBD oil. You with me? There, you do find standards for how do you make aspirin, how do you make ibuprofen, how do you make co codeine, not cocaine, but how do you make codeine? <laughs> Actually, I guess you have standards, pharmaceutical standards for cocaine too. It does happen. But, uh, but anyway, uh, all those things have standards that they can say when you manufacture it has to meet these guidelines, it has to meet these levels, it has to pass this testing. No such thing for CBD. It's just kind of a free-for-all. I call it the Wild West right now for CBD. And so I want to kind of warn you about something. Tell your people, because how many of you have the question, hey, I've taken CBD oil. There are questions about that. It is different than THC, which is the active ingredient that makes you stoned with marijuana. Two different things, harvested differently, differently from the same plant. But CBD oil, because there's no standards, you don't know what you're getting. You might not be getting a marijuana product at all. Or you might be getting something that's tainted with THC. We don't know. This stuff can be manufactured in somebody's garage, okay? So be careful about that because really, since there's no standard, they take it at their own risk, okay? I just don't know how, I can't give you a better answer than that. They could be taking it at their own risk. I don't know any science to back up the statement I'm about to tell you. I can just tell you anecdotal things, but I've had HR directors tell me, there's a couple of places in our town that sell CBD and one of them can show me all the paperwork of their laboratory manufacturing processes, and I think they're very legit. And there's another one that's kind of sketchy. And he goes, I've had people who buy from that place come back and fail their tests, okay? Because some of them will tell you, don't do this if you're going to be taking a drug re work-related drug test, because they kind of can't stand behind the possibility there might be THC in there, okay? So be, be, let your people know. Be careful about that, because you, you're in a bind. If you have a non-marijuana positive policy, and they fail the test. Now, let me be real clear about that. If you're using an MRO and somebody comes in and they are positive for marijuana, that means that they screen positive for marijuana, confirm positive for marijuana, and the MRO could not find a license to have that marijuana. They've called. There's also a registry online they can go to. There was no prescribing physician. That's a failed test. It's just the same thing as the person on codeine that didn't have a prescription for it. Okay? It's the exact same thing. So the MRO can take care of that and still give you a positive answer a positive result. Positive is not good. Positive is negative in this case, <laughs> but you get the idea. I have people fight, battle with that. Now negative is good. No, positive is good. No, positive is bad. So <laughs> positive is not what we want, okay? Anyway, I am pretty much done with what I was going to cover. Is there any questions or topics that y'all want to try to discuss? Yes, ma'am. Chuck, I have a question uh, about medical marijuana. An MRO who reviews uh, a test and it's positive for marijuana and there's a license. Mm -hmm. And, employers in a difficult situation. And, and you are with codeine, too. You are with codeine. And no well, there are levels. There are cutoffs, yes. But even the employer doesn't get those. If it's done, if it's done properly, the, the, there are levels that they call it negative or positive. Uh, for example, marijuana has levels, too, that if I'm around marijuana and smelling it, it's getting into my body or I wouldn't smell it. And so they have, you, you've heard the story, I'm sure. I was in my friend's Volkswagen. They had all the windows rolled up. Uh, and I, they were smoking, but I wasn't. Well, passive inhalation, the, you have to be, have an answer for that. So they have cutoffs that they call. Anything below that's negative. Um, but with codeine or other painkiller opiates, opioids, the therapeutic range can still be wildly broad. You can have a very high, and they're within therapeutic ranges. You know, they're not abusing it. It's because it peaks and it troughs in their body as they're taking it. They're, you might find them at a peak time. And it doesn't mean they're stoned. It just means that it's, high, it's, it's highest concentration in their system. So marijuana, um, you're, you're going to run into the same thing. So considering that, mm -hmm. it's really important for employers to look at uh, the, the employee's behavior, to take into consideration what their conduct is like to determine mm -hmm. if there is impairment, you're right. since the result is going to come back negative. Right. And, and I'll give you a really unfortunate uh, truth about that. If, if, if people forget marijuana just for a second, any drug that's overused, uh, there are cases where people 
are showing signs of impairment on the job site and they pass their test because they have a prescription for it. And clearly, you can look at them, they're almost catatonic and you're thinking they're abusing what they're taking. And uh, we've had cases where the employer is really between a rock and a hard place. They, they want to deal with it, but they keep passing their tests. Uh, again, let me go back to DOT just for a second. The MRO can say they should not be driving, okay? Uh, yeah, and so you can have, there would be policies where you can say, I need to know if that's the case. Uh, again, DOT does not permit marijuana at all right now. There's no exception. You can't, if you're on medical marijuana, there's other drugs you can't drive and, you, and take at the same time. And marijuana will just be one of those. Um, but anyway, so, so if, if there's somebody who's showing signs of impairment on the job site and they keep passing their drug tests, it may mean, and what we've seen happen is the employer will say, okay, I want you to go see the medical examiner or I want you to bring me a note from your doctor. And it doesn't have to tell me what you're taking or why you're taking it but I need to know that you're under prescription. And every time they come in looking impaired, you keep asking for that note again and again and again. And finally, it will open a dialogue where the doctor's calling you going, why do you need this every other day? And you can tell them. And the doctor might go, wait a minute. I need to adjust their medication or I need to talk to my patient while they're overtaking it. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is, is um, when you have people who are, well, that's a whole different topic. I, uh, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, so, okay, so good deal. Anything else? Now, don't tell me we've covered it so well that you have no questions. You know what's going to happen? It's going to sit down and everybody's going, oh, I wish I would have asked yeah. such and such. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is there a website or document or some resource where the cities can go and find out if the lab they're using mm -hmm. is following either the state law or the DOT yeah. law? Uh, there is licensure in the state of Oklahoma. Can I tell you what my experience has been? They, they should be licensed where you can go look them up and uh, they can say, we've issued them a license for this year, they're in good standing. But I've even talked to some of those places and I go, are you in a program of doing unknowns? And what unknowns means is I do my quick testing and I've subscribed to a, a regulatory body that every six months they send me, for example, a dozen specimens. And they're unknown in that I don't know what's gonna be inside of those specimens. And I have to test my quick testing methods and I have to get back 100% correct about what are they positive for. You with me? And so, okay, specimen number one was marijuana positive. Specimen number two was cocaine positive. Specimen number three was negative, okay? And go back and answer back, and it's really involved. And a lot of times, I ask that question and they go, huh? That's their answer. Well, who's your director? Uh, the boss. Yes, but I mean, who is overseeing your standard operating procedure? Who's making sure you're trained the right way? Uh, huh? I've been through collection training. No, no, no. I know you've been through collection training. What about the testing you're doing? We're not testing, we're collecting. Are you doing a quick test? Yes, I am. You're testing, okay? And so there's a lot of places out there that are doing it incorrectly, I'm just gonna tell you. I mean, I've had that question more often than not when I have that question, they have no idea what an unknown is. That's pretty telling, okay? So uh, yes, you need to find out, but it's okay uh, I know I'm giving a broader answer than you're asking, but DOT is very clear. Uh, DOT is putting responsibility on the employers. They have a magazine thick uh, guide for employers that you're supposed to go in and visit your collection sites. You're supposed to go in and make sure, okay, show me where you do your collections. Oh, is the water blued? Where do you have them take off their jackets? Uh, where do you have them wash their hands? Can I see how you handle this, this, and this? I want to see your breath testing equipment. I just want to make sure you're doing it correctly. You're actually supposed to watch and make sure they fill out the form in the right order, okay? I mean, they actually educate the employers about that. It's not a bad idea if you go visit your collection sites every once in a while, for DOT and non-DOT. Make sure they're doing their job correctly, okay? If you need guidance, I can, I can send you that link to, it's a DOT thing, but understand the mindset shouldn't be, well, we're, it's sacred, we're doing a DOT test, oh, but for non-DOT, who cares? It should be identical in the mindset. As far as the care, the confidentiality, the accuracy, the testing should all be the same, okay? Cutoffs might be different, but not, not the mindset of the testing. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, you're saying your MRO will check for their license and then will report them as negative. Right. Okay. Our lab is telling us that they're going to screen to see if they have a license, but still report them as positive and tell them to contact the employer and give it on, on the screen. It will say it is necessary for employers and other end users of this lab to interpret and act upon any positive marijuana. In accordance with their state laws. Right. So yours is 
different than what ours is. Well, does. but do you see what it does? Doesn't that not open you up to know things maybe you shouldn't know preliminarily? Right, right. And so that's thus my crusade. That's what I'm saying. Yes. What you're reading. Right. Right, right now, you're put in a bind by knowing anything ahead of time. It would be safer for you as the employer, and this is what I'm saying about being in that meeting where I'm listening to the attorney talk. He was saying the exact same thing. He goes, if your people are taking marijuana, you need to have a mechanism so they can divulge that to you. Why? If I'm taking codeine, do I have to tell you that? You know what I mean? Do I have to tell you I'm taking codeine? No. In fact, I'm supposed to not tell you I'm taking codeine, okay? I can tell you I shouldn't be functioning in certain capacities. My doctors told me put you, put you have you put me on light duty. Sure, yeah, I can do that, but I'm not supposed to tell you I'm dealing with such and such and I'm taking this and that. And marijuana can be treated exactly the same way. Right now, it just throws it in your lap. Deal with it. You're the employer. And, and I, again, I, I know I keep preaching this, but I just want to go back to the idea of using really standard testing, that there's no quick testing done on the site if possible. I'm not espousing any certain lab. I promise you I'm not. Just get it to a real laboratory that does real screening and real confirmations behind closed doors and reports to a medical review officer who knows what they're doing, okay? A certified medical review officer. They're certifying bodies. They're called like American Association of Medical Review Officers, uh, MRO Inc. There's different agencies that approve these people and you'd want to use an MRO that actually functions in that way, okay? Yeah, and ours is saying because it's not a prescription that they are not going to consider it. Right, right, but it, it is a prescription in, in, a, in the truest sense of the word, if a doctor's giving you the authority to get a license for it, it is a prescription of sorts. So the MRO would still have that thing to do, you know. But, but uh, that's, a, that's a point right there. Again, that's a good example of what you, you it kind of leaves you in, flapping in the wind about what you're going to do. And it's, a, it's not a very, there's, I think, a better way to do it. I think there's a more um, standardized way to do it that would keep everything just above board where you don't have to ask you know, intermittent questions when you don't need to. Anything else? Have I ticked anybody off royally this, this <laughs> afternoon? Hope not. Okay. All right. Good deal. Are we done? All right. Thank you very much.